few left in December. There's a, a whole batch of the January issue. And so pick those up as you walk out. Some tremendous articles in there. And uh, this was, uh, there was a, a gentleman who started this, uh, went to a doctor's office just some time back and was looking at different magazines and really didn't find anything in there that he was that kept his attention, anything he was interested in. So he said, you know, Lord, there ought to be somebody put together a magazine that we can put in a doctor's office that will edify people. And uh, so he said, the Lord said, well, why don't you do it? He said, well, I don't know anything about magazines. He said, but I'll put you in touch with people who do. I don't have the money. Well, I'll put you in touch with people who do. And so that's where this, this thing came about. And so uh, Living Glory Church has purchased an ad in this, in this magazine. So we will be in every doctor's office uh, and, and every, most of the business facilities in Karen Crow and North Lafayette. And so um, pick some of those up or pick one of them up, leave some for the other people. And so, and if you don't pick them up by the end of the month, we will put them in the bulletin and hand them out to you. Uh, so one way or the other, you will get one. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it's good to see you this morning. I am glad to be here. Uh, we had an opportunity to get a couple of days off, a couple of days rest uh, uh, over the holidays. I trust that you did too. Uh, we're glad that things can get back to normal. Uh, and I always add whatever normal is, <laughs> you know, and, and so especially our eating habits can get back to some, some semblance of normal, amen, so we can shake off those extra few pounds that all of us seem to put on around the holidays. Usually at the beginning of the year, I take a Sunday to just kind of let people know uh, What's the vision of Living Glory Church? Uh, I, I like, I did a message, and the title of it years ago was, Where's This Bus Going? Uh, simply meaning that, you know, we're heading somewhere. And, and you need to know where we're headed. Uh, if, if we're headed in a direction that you don't want to go in, then you need to get off this bus and find another bus. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we also recognize that as a church, there are individuals who will join us through, uh, uh, through the year, and some will stay with us uh, for years, and some will stay with us for months, and then as the Lord leads them, you know, we're not, you know, saying that, you know, God can't lead someone to either another community, perhaps, or another church, but I don't believe the Lord will ever lead you to stay at home. And, uh, and be uh, disconnected from the body of Christ. I believe that he will plant you in a place for two reasons. One, you will be a blessing to that place, to that organization, to that church. You will be able to hook up with the pastor and the, and the, and the leadership of that, of that ministry. And you'll be able to support them with your prayer your finances, and with your time and your effort, uh, you'll be able to do that. But at the same time, it's not going to be all about you, you giving. There will be a, 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 a season or a time frame or a, a reciprocation of the blessing where then you then receive from the ministry. Where you make a decision, you come in and say, I'm going to allow the pastor to speak into my life. I'm going to get involved with what's there so that the ministry can be a blessing to me and in my life. And so that's, that's part of the reciprocal uh, effect of belonging to a church. And so I, I like to say it this way, you know, God brought Abraham and he says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. And so God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing. And so we always take this verse of Scripture, and so I chose this Sunday to be the time that I would, uh, I would share 
uh, what Living Word, Living Glory Church is all about and, and why we're here. And uh, take some time. It's not going to be a pre big preaching type of thing. Uh, and hopefully it'll speak to your heart to let you know. Because through the year of 2014, we've had some new families that have come in. And, and they, they may not, you know, they hear a little bit here and there, but may not have the overall picture of what, of what we're here, why we're here. So um, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 2. It says, write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that they may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will, it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. You see, the realizing that the vision can be written, but the vision is for future. The vision is so that individuals who are hooking up can read the vision and can run with it. And, or, in, in other words, get involved with what the vision might be uh, for that organization. I I believe that every business should have a vision. Every business should have a mission statement, if you would, or a goal that, that it can achieve. And, and as, a, as a church, our, our premise, our underlying foundation is to help you to move to a higher level in your relationships. First of all, a higher, a higher level in your relationship with God, a higher level in your relationship with your family. Family, well, with the family of God and a higher uh, understanding of moving into a deeper, higher revelation with the community around us, realizing that we as a church and we as individuals need to have a cause, a purpose that's greater than my own interest, a cause and a purpose that's greater than me. And so when we look at all of those things, it, it formulates for us a, um, a, a goal that, first of all, we must, as a church and as individuals, not be motivated by money, not be motivated by the temporal, but be motivated by eternity. Realizing that though we might live a hundred years, that is only a blink of an eye when it comes to eternity. Our motivation for the things in this life must be so that we spend eternity with the King, with the God of the universe, with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. That our, our eternity, our motivation for the things we do today must not just be for my paycheck at the end of the week or the next recreation time that we have or the next uh, 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 New Year's Day celebration or, or the next uh, a carnal or uh, temporal activity. Listen, none of those things in themselves are bad, but our motivation for life must be eternity, must be the fact that I am not uh, just a natural human being. I am a spiritual being. I am a spirit. I live in this body and I have a soul. And so my, my, uh, at one time or other, uh, this body will cease to function. This body will stop, but my soul and my spirit will live on. So I must live my life today uh, as though it were my last day motivated by the fact that eternity is my home and that's where I'm heading. Amen. Some of you looking at me kind of strange. How does that have to do with the vision? That is our motivation. And so when we realize that, we, I, I want to read you that verse of Scripture in the New Living Translation. It says, write my answer in large, clear letters on a tablet so that a runner can read it and tell everyone else. The New Century Version says, write down the vision, write it clearly on clay tablets so that whoever reads it can run and tell others. In other words, it is not the vision comes down from the, through the pastor from the Lord, and he writes it down, makes it plain, so that those who hear it, those who can identify with it, those who, who hook up with it, can take that vision and they can run with it. 
They can begin to tell others, this is the vision, this is the purpose, this is why we're here, this is why Living Glory Church is here. It's not here to give Pastor Carl a place to preach on Sunday morning. It's not here so Pastor B can have a place to sing on Sunday morning. It's here to reach into the community. It's here to do something beside just an opportunity for people to come together and congregate and have a little social activity or have a little religious activity. It's here for a greater purpose than that, and we need to understand that greater purpose. And so there, are, there must always be both a mission statement or a goal. What are we trying to reach? And then there is a vision. How are we going to reach that goal? Uh, the, the mission statement, the mission is the general broad sentence of, of what we're all about. But the, the, the vision is the step-by-step -step procedure, the nuts and bolts, if you would, that is put down, written down, so that people can see this is the goal, this is where we're headed, but, and, and, but this is how we're going to get there. Because it's not, it's not enough just to have a goal. you got to have some steps on how are we going to get to that goal. And really, the church should be patterned after Jesus. You remember that Jesus had a mission. He had a mission. He was sent here for a purpose. In uh, John chapter, um, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Jesus came to fulfill the, the Old Testament, to fulfill the law and the prophets. And I think that Jesus fulfilled his ministry, did he not? First John chapter 3 and verse, uh, first John 3 verse 8 says, For this purpose was the Son of Man manifest, manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, we have to realize that Jesus destroyed the works of Satan. Amen. He destroyed Satan's captivity over humanity. He destroyed uh, sin. He destroyed sickness. He destroyed those things. And the more we become, that becomes revelation to us, the more we can be set free from those things that Satan tries to bind us with and those things we can get set free from. Amen. But Jesus fulfilled his ministry. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, there's two premises there with the thing that was lost. One, um, he came to seek and save humanity, that you and I were lost. And some say, well, you know, I found God. No, actually, God found you. You know, God was never lost. We were lost, but God was never lost. So he came that he might fulfill, save the lost. But also another part of that is the fact of what was lost in the garden. What was lost in the garden was Adam's authority to rule and reign over his sphere, over planet Earth. And so Jesus came back, uh, Jesus came so that he might seek and save, he might restore to humanity, to you and I, the authority that we have in him over the things of the natural. And so, uh, but the more revelation we have of that, the greater the authority we walk in. Amen? And so Jesus came to do just that. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, The thief comes not, to, not but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy is the way it says. And I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. And so that's a very familiar f a passage with us. And so we realize that Jesus had a purpose. He had a goal, and he was set. But how did he go about accomplishing that goal? We find that, and that's the vision, that's the method, the methodology, the statements, the steps that he took. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 says, For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to reco the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so we find that Jesus went about preaching and teaching and healing. What did, how did Jesus fulfill his mission? He went about declaring. He went went about proclaiming. He went about uh, demonstrating the power of God, the love of God, all that God had put in him. You have to realize Jesus did everything he did as a man anointed by the Holy Ghost. If what he did was by was because he was the Son of God, now keep in mind, he was absolutely 100% the Son of God. But what he did for humanity was done as a man, 100% man, anointed by the Holy Ghost. If he had not done it that way, then he would not be in error to make this statement in John chapter 14, verse 12, when he says, the things I do, you shall do also, and greater things than these shall you do because I go to the Father. That would be an absolute lie if Jesus had not operated strictly by the Holy Ghost and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus fulfilled everything he did. And so some people want to concern themselves, what's the greater works? What's the greater work that Jesus that, 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 than, than what Jesus did? What could be greater than raising somebody from the dead? What could be greater than walking on water? What could be greater than causing blind eyes to be healed? Well, the one thing that could be greater, and I want to throw this out for your thought, is that Jesus could not get anybody born again. Because his blood had not been sacrificed. The payment for sin had not been made. Not until Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross, carried his blood to the mercy seat, laid his blood on the mercy seat, and said it is, he said it was finished on the cross, accomplishing all that the Old Testament was intended to accomplish. And in the mind and eye of God, when Jesus rose from the dead, all humanity was raised. All humanity had the opportunity. And we say being born again. It just simply means that when I make Jesus the Lord of my life, that his blood has now washed away my sin, and I can become born again. I can become a child of God, not just his creation, but now become his son and his daughter. And so when you or me introduces Jesus to someone, and we tell them, listen, God died for your sins Jesus died on the cross just for you. And they open up their heart and say, I receive that and I believe it. Then guess what? You have done a work that's greater than what Jesus could have done while he was on planet earth. And so it's not a matter of the quantity, it's the matter of what of the quality of what Jesus said. And I believe Jesus saw this and understood this. And so as, as, as a person, as a, as a man, as a woman, I've got to be aware of the anointing and the power that's on the inside of me because of the Word and because of the Spirit. Hallelujah. In then Jesus makes a statement that's really curious. In Luke chapter 19, verse 13, he says, Occupy until I come. Now, what does that mean? I believe he's trying to get us to see, occupy in the same mission, in the same vision that I have as my church, as the body of Christ, occupy, do the things that you know to do in order for uh, my ministry to be complete, my ministry to be fulfilled. And you see, the whole premise of a church is not to be a social club. It's not to be a religious organization. The whole premise is to establish and to enlarge the kingdom of heaven to bring, to populate the kingdom of God, to bring people out of darkness into light, to bring people, to allow them to see that there's a better way to live. 
Amen? Uh, the, the keynote verse of Scripture, or you might say the foundation Scripture for Living Glory Church, is found in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 5. It says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, a darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise over you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. Uh, and folks, I believe that as the days progress, as the years progress, we can see in our lifetime uh, some things that have gotten darker in the culture of our, of our country. In the culture of the world, uh, you know, who'd have thought uh, when I was uh, in my teen years or, or, or early, even as, even as late as 10 or 12 years ago, who'd have thought same-sex marriage would be legal? Who'd have thought that abortion would have taken 68 million babies? Who'd have thought that... that uh, 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 slave trade would still be active in all races. Who'd have thought there have been the wars and the atrocities that are taking place? Who'd have thought that these things would have ever come to pass? None of us did. And yet here it is. And we're faced with some of that right in our own neighborhood. Amen? And so we recognize that the darkness is getting darker. But the Word says that when the darkness is getting darker, the brighter the light will shine out in the darkness. And you and I are part of the light. And the Word says that His light will shine upon us more and more and more. Amen? And then the first three says, And the Gentiles will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together and come to you. Your son shall come from afar. Your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. And your heart shall swell with joy, not with pride, but with joy. Because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The... the the, the multitude of camels shall come from your land, will cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephra, all those, come, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. That is the, the premise. That's the foundational scripture for Living Glory Church. And so what's our mission as a church, what is our mission? You see it in the, on your, uh, um, the bulletin. You see it on the, uh, uh, the handouts. It says basically three phrase uh, goal is that Living Glory Church is established to touch hearts. It's established to restore hope. And it's established to heal lives. And so we simply say the goal of Living Glory Church is for touching hearts, restoring hope, and healing lives. In order to heal lives, we've got to touch their hearts. In order to restore hope, we've got to, we've got to have a method by which that's done. So how do we get this goal? Everything we do at Living Glory Church, everything we do must have answer the question, is this going to touch hearts? Is this going to restore hope? Is this going to heal lives? And so we have to look at everything we do, even from the most spiritual to the most, why don't we use the word carnal, but the most fun activity we come up with has to do something that will touch any one of those three things. Amen. And so uh, the goal then for Living Glory Church, the, the vision as the Lord has put it in my heart is number one, we have to create an atmosphere for the glory of God. Without the glory of God, without his presence, then we can become so stale and we become so rigid that we become another religion, another religious uh, organization and, uh, and church becomes another religious activity. 
It just becomes something we do on Sunday morning, Saturday night, or Wednesday night, whichever you choose, and it has no life in it, no breath in it, nothing that will, that will touch your heart, nothing that will restore any hope, and nothing that will change anybody's life or heal anything. And so it's imperative that we have the, the presence, the glory of God in our place. And so that comes about by, by a number of different things. But number one, it comes about by prayer. It's not the, the eloquence of the teacher. It's not the eloquence and the education or the preparedness of the minister. It has to do with prayer and humbling ourselves before God. The Word says that Jesus uh, departed to the mountains to pray. It says that occasionally Jesus spent all night in prayer. When was the last time you prayed all night? Jesus uh, uh, continued and realized that there was a, a connection with God. And God showed up, the Holy Ghost showed up in Jesus' meetings because he was spending time with him, which was not a public time, but rather was a private time. Amen? And so every Sunday morning, there's a handful of people who meet in the conference room, and they meet to pray. They pray for you. They pray for every seat that's here to be filled. They pray for those that come in that are lost will be saved. Those that They pray for those who come in sick will be healed. Those who come in confused will leave encouraged. They pray for the, the Spirit of God to move in our church. If you want to join them, 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, you're welcome to come. Thursday mornings, Pastor B has a group of ladies that meets. And if they're not doing the interactive Bible study, they pray. And they pray for you. And they pray for your children. They pray for our neighborhoods. They pray for our country. They pray for things. And why are we doing that? Because God is limited unless people pray. God will not move in the lives and in the church of individuals who are not in prayer. And so it's important that we have individual prayer, but we also have some corporate prayer. Amen. And so uh, this year, we're starting on the January the 18th. We're going to have a week of prayer and fasting. We'll have more information about that next Sunday as far as the prayer focus. And so what we're asking is this thing, two things from you. One is that you take a two-hour block of time. And in that two-hour block of time, you avoid secular television. You avoid computer games and activities, and especially Facebook. You, you avoid those things for that two-hour block of time. And some of you just see some of you shaking their head. I'm not on Facebook. Don't even have a computer. Well, you're in a, you have an advantage over the rest of us. And so that's what we're asking you to do. And in that two-hour period of time, don't find some other activity to do, but take the time to spend, spend that two-hour block of time either in God's Word, uh, in prayer, or some form of spiritual reading, and we'll have a, a whole bunch of uh, Christian magazines in the, in the foyer next week that you can choose from if you don't have any reading material. If you do, then, then find something. Maybe you've read a book that, that it ministered to you years ago. Pick it up again. And let the Spirit of God speak to your heart. And, and then on, Monday, on Wednesday night, we will come together as a corporate body. You do this at home. And then on Wednesday night, you come together as a corporate body, as many of you as who can. And we will worship God and spend some time in corporate prayer for that week. Amen? And, so, uh, and then next week, we will have a list or a prayer focus for you. Uh, something for Monday night, something for Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday. Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. And then we conclude that with our moving on in victory the following Sunday. And we just come and rejoice and see what God wants to do. Amen? And so we encourage you to do that. Hallelujah. So the next thing is part of, a part of worship, okay, but it has to do with our praise and worship. Now, I'm, I'm going to get on a soapbox a little bit. It gives me an opportunity to do that in front of everybody. I recognize that there are some of you who have some issues with your hearing. 
And that sometimes the music, because of your hearing aid, because of your hearing, and, 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 and some of you know, who, you know who I'm referring to, it, it becomes just noise, and it's very difficult for you to be in praise and worship, and I understand that. And so it's okay for you to stay in the foyer. But if you're not one of those, then I believe that your place, when that, that first note strikes up, is not to be sitting in the foyer, not to be fellowshipping in the foyer, unless you're, a, unless you're a greeter and your responsibility is to greet the last few stragglers who come in, then your responsibility is to be in here and hooking up with us in praise. Amen? Now, I recognize, listen, uh, we start at 10 o'clock. And I told Pastor B, we're going to start at 10 o'clock if it's just her and I and the band. Amen? Uh, and, and the praise and worship team. We're going to start at 10 o'clock. Uh, and, and so I would encourage you. I'm not going to be legalistic about this and say you can't ever show up late. Because I know that there are some times when you just can't get here at 10 o'clock. I understand that. But your heart and your, your desire and your, your, your time uh, priorities should be, I'm going to walk through the door at least two minutes ahead of 10 o'clock because I don't want to miss anything. Why? Because it's not just an add-on. It's not a preliminary. It's not just something we do while you get here so you can hear the Word. It is, an, it is a function of getting the presence of God in this place. Amen. And if you want a, 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 some scriptural background on that, Second Chronicles chapter 5, 13 and 14 says, when the trumpeters and singers were as one and they made one sound to be heard in praising and thanking God. And when they lifted their voices with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord singing for he is good for his mercy endures forever, that the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord fill the house we want the glory fill in our house amen hallelujah number two first we want to create an atmosphere secondly a purpose of the church is to communicate the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God and we do that through outreach we do that through evangelism. We do that to proclaim, to preach, and to declare the good things that God has done for us. Amen. And so it's important that we go where the people are. And so uh, there are some things that we do as Living Glory Church that will help that. There's some things that we've done in the past, some things that we just believe are, are some things for the future. Amen. The number one reason why people will attend church is that somebody invited them. 85% of people when polled, unchurched people when polled, said, what would, why would... What would cause you to go to church? Said somebody would invite me. And so we have to invite people with an excitement that God is doing something in our church. Now, they may not come the first time. They may not come the second time. But if you'll be persistent, they will come. Amen. And we will see these empty chairs filled. And we will see God. And see, the only way that God will touch their hearts through this ministry, at, at least at that point, is for them to, to be here. Amen? And so that's, that's part of it. Now, we have a television program that airs at 8.30 on Sunday morning. Uh, and, it, and it airs four times during the week, and it's all on Channel 16, Channel AOC. And by the way, Angela, it was not on there this morning. And so I know Angela takes care of that, and she stays on top, and I probably should have told you after, but it's not her fault, something with AOC. The number two reason why people have visited our church has been our website. It's amazing that people are not looking at the yellow pages anymore. They're looking at the website. 
And they will go, they'll type in a Google search. And if you can type in a Google search for word churches in Lafayette, faith churches in Lafayette, we are on the front page. We work hard at staying on the front page because most people will never go beyond the first page in their Google search. If it's not on page one, they're not going to find it. And so we, we, we know that because in our, in our guest card, in our communication card, we ask people, how did you hear about us? And almost 80% of the people who visit our church for the first time have done it over the internet. I had one little lady, and, 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 and she, she, I, I asked her, I said, how did you find our church? She said, I looked at the internet. She said, I, I just woke up this morning. I knew I had to be in church, and I wanted to be in a church where nobody knew me, and I wanted to just go in church and be anonymous. And she said, something close to the house, and praise the Lord, she's been with us ever since. You know, and so we, that, that's part of the outreach. It's part of what we do. We're going to extend. And, and, you know, I realize that there's some things Facebook people don't want to do anything on Facebook, but it is a tool that we can use. Amen. There's another thing that we're going to use this year to reach you and stay connected with you. This is probably should be further down. It, it's really going to be called uh, text alerts. You get the text alerts about sales and things that are going on. We're going to text alert you and let you know what's happening here at Living Glory Church. Amen. And so the, all those things, are, we're working on a, on a Living Glory Church app. Those, you know, um, I realize some of you don't have a computer, but guess what? 99% of the millennials, that's the kids that are under 30 years old, have computers. They've got iPhones or, or smartphones. They've got iPads or some type of thing. And if we're going to reach that generation, we're going to have to reach them with the media that they use. Amen? And so that's going to be part of what we're doing, part of the outreach. We have, um, and, and this, this is kind of the, I don't know if I call it the boring part of the message, but just tell them, telling you what we do. And we have some outreach events that if you don't recognize them as outreach events, then you won't invite people to come. At the end of the month, we have our Moving On in Victory meeting. We have guest ministers come in. It'll be Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night this year. Uh, men that, are, that, will, that will speak into your life. And, and I'm urging you to be here all three services, not just Sunday morning, because that's what you're accustomed to. Saturday night will be one minister. Uh, Sunday morning will be the same minister. And then Sunday night will be someone else. Dr. Jeff will be with us Sunday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning. And Dr. and uh, Brother Dean will be with us on Sunday night. And not only for you to be here, certainly it's an encouragement to us and to them to see a full house. But if you bring someone, invite someone, I guarantee you that they will speak into their life. Amen. And then we have uh, in May, uh, April rather, we're going to have a ladies conference. And it's not just to minister to the ladies of Living Glory Church and Hope Chapel. It's to minister to all your friends. And so uh, we're, we're praying as to who to invite. And so it's important that you just invite people and be part of that. In June, we'll have a men's conference. Uh, we do this every year. And so it's not just to, to, to have the, the men of the church rally, but rather to have a, a, an outreach into the community. Amen. These are all part of the outreach. Right now, we we're, we're have part of the what's called the Faith and Character Task Force, which just a number of couple of ladies, several ladies are working at Evangeline Elementary uh, every third uh, Wednesday, uh, doing some some stuff there. And uh, we could use some more help. We could use a few more ladies who would be involved in that. And you can uh, see Sarah LeBlanc after. If, if that's something you can do, if you don't work on Wednesday, then that would be uh, great for you to participate and help us in that area. Amen. The word says in Matthew chapter 22, it says, go into the highways and into the byways. And as many as you find, invite them. Invite them to come in. The New Living Translation says, Go out to the street corners and every, invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the ballroom was filled. <laughs> Glory to God. And so invite everybody. Uh, 
I, I, you know, now I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something here that I don't know how, you, how you're going to receive it. But you know what? We're not trying to transplant people from other non-denominational full gospel churches. We're not trying to transplant people from other churches. We're trying to get the unchurched to go to church. You know, I, I realize that the, the, the people you'd want to invite, perhaps, are people who are already part of a church, and, and you're trying to, you know, you, you tell them to come. And, you know, now if they're disgruntled and they're not satisfied where they are, or they're, not, or they're staying home on Sunday a, instead of going to church, then invite them. But, you know, uh, the thing that just always bothered me was that people, family members, would invite people from our church to go visit another church. And they kept after them and after them and after them. Before long, they went over and stayed. You know, now, if God moves somebody, then I'm the first one to receive them. But on the other hand, I don't want to be the, 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 the crowbar that moves people uh, to this church out of another church. Does that make sense to you? Listen, if everybody that is born again that does not go to church on Sunday morning, showed up next Sunday, there are not enough seats in the churches of Lafayette to fit them. And so we don't have to try to transplant saints. We don't have to try to steal somebody else's congregation. What we need to do is focus, Lord, who in my sphere, who around me do I know that doesn't go to church anymore? Who around me can I approach to invite them to our church? And that's where we need to focus about the invitation. Amen. Number three is that we need to, uh, within those, we need to begin to cultivate people's hearts. And it's all part of being what's called discipling. Uh, you see, a farmer, uh, he plows up the field, he plants the crop, and then he harvests the crop. So it's not enough just to get people in church. It's not enough just to get them saved or born again. It's important that we disciple them, that we make them a disciple of Jesus, that we, that we help them in their growth to be more of what Jesus wanted them to do. And so it's important that we follow those precepts. Jesus said in Matthew 28, go into all the nations and make disciples. He didn't say just go get them saved. He said to go and make disciples. So how do you make a disciple? You encourage them to be in the place where the word is ministered, where the word is taught. And so I like to say it this way. You know, we have discipleship meetings every week. Our discipleships are on Wednesday night at 7, Saturday night at 6, and Sunday morning at 10. And people who want to be discipled will be in those ministers, in those services at those times. Why? Because it, discipleship isn't dependent upon, as much upon the teacher as it is on the student. See, if I want to be a disciple, I'm going to make myself available to the teacher. I am going to find the place where I can be fed, where I'll receive something. And so it's a mindset and a change rather than just say, I'm going to go sit in church and get my, my religious obligation done because, you know, I just don't want to miss the blessing. No, I come to church not so that I can give something, in the case of a pastor, not so that I can receive something, but what am I? going to receive. Because see, even though I'm preaching the message, there's some things the Lord's speaking to my heart and changing within me. Amen? And so I have to come with the understanding, what can I grasp today that'll bring me closer in my relationship with God? What one thing, what thing can I receive that'll help me in the week to come, the month to come, the year to come, that'll help me overcome the difficulties and the challenges that we have?
And so in order to be discipling, in order to, to do that, uh, our church has to have uh, ministry to the children, and we do. And we minister to the children on what, what I call age-appropriate curriculum, that we don't try to teach the children about the end times and about the seventh, day, seventh week of Daniel uh, or, or, or some of those things, but we will teach them about the Daniel and the lion's den, that God will protect you in very difficult things. Things. And we use curriculum that's age appropriate. We use, uh, we have uh, Brother John and Miss Linda uh, Reddick are taking care and they're dealing with our AMP student ministry. And, uh, and we're going to kick it up a notch this year. And so I believe that uh, before long, uh, we're going to start a fund. We need a van. Because uh, uh, many of the teenagers that come uh, aren't, don't come because they don't have transportation. And so Brother John is going to pick some of them up. In fact, I've done that for years. You may not know this, but uh, for years on Wednesday night, I would go pick, pick the kids up and bring them to church. For, for several years, I picked kids up on Sunday morning and brought them to church. And you may not know that, but I, I did that because I wanted them the opportunity to be here. And so it's grown beyond what I can do. And so we need a van. And we're going to ask you to pray. And just uh, we're going we're gonna to set a budget budget goal for about $10,000, and we're going to believe for uh, uh, that money to come in so we can purchase a 15-passenger van so we can transport our kids. Amen? And so we teach adults, and, and you know, this year, I'm telling you, right ahead of time, these are some of the topics that you're going to hear this year. You're going to hear about what does it mean to be in Christ, the realities of being in the body of Christ, being in Jesus. What does that mean for us? And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the kingdom of heaven and what does it mean to be to reside in the kingdom of heaven and to reside on earth at the same time because we live in two spheres or two worlds. We're going to look at, we're going to spend some time with divine healing. We're going to spend some time on, on, on finances and, and uh, to, what I call total life prosperity. It's not all about money, but there is something with it. Amen. And so God wants us to be prosperous totally in our total life. And so uh, th there's, a, there's a, a, a word that's been rolling around in my spirit for the last several months and God's been placing something together and, and it's going to be a series I don't know just how soon it'll come next year but it won't be too far off uh, it, it's getting a lot closer but I want to drop that word for you today it's the word catalyst a catalyst is a substance or an element that introduced into another environment will change that environment without itself being changed by the environment of the culture around it. You see, you and I are ambassadors of Christ. You have the Word of God, the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. You live in a sphere. You live in a, in, in a world that if you are supposed to uh, be the catalyst in that world, you're supposed to influence your neighborhood, your, your, your places of business, your places of work. You're supposed to influence your family without those things influencing you adversely. You're supposed to be the catalyst, and we're going to look at some of that this year. The fourth thing that the church has to do is not just com com create an atmosphere for the glory, not just communicate the good news of the, of the gospel, not just cultivate and make disciples, but we're intended to connect people. Amen. You see, we're the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 tells us all the things uh, of the body of Christ. And, and listen, uh, all of us are connected, whether you like it or not. You're connected to the person next to you. And God wants us to connect each to each other. Because uh, without each other, in Philippians, um, mm -mm, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It says that, that we equip, well, let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. Our church, Living Glory Church, has what's called an in-touch ministry. That in-touch ministry means that we're in touch with God, but we're in touch with each other. 
And at present, we have five, or five groups that meet. That's our small group ministry. Now, some churches boast to have the life groups and the cell groups. This is our ministry. It's the in-touch ministry. We have the new beginnings, the couples, the couples. That's our married couples. That's the group of married people that, that meet. They meet twice a month. And listen, if you're, if you're having some challenges in your marriage, that's where you need to be. If you just want to get closer together, that's where you need to be. It is a, it is a, a ministry to married couples that will help them develop their relationship with each other and at the same time connect with other married couples. Then we have the, the young at heart. That's the, those of us who are 55 and older, and they meet once a month, and, and some of it is social, and some of it is activities, but a lot of it is just being able to connect and be there for one another. Listen, it's important in our world where you become more and more a number everywhere you go. You become a number with your, with your bank. You become a number at the hospital. You become a number in the school system. You become a number everywhere you are, it's important that you become a person at Living Glory Church, that we want to connect with you. And so it, 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 uh, it eliminates the, the loneliness uh, feeling. We don't meet every week. We don't meet every night. But, it can, but there's somebody that's there that you know that they're praying for you. And so there's a connection. There's a ladies' interactive Bible study on Thursday morning, the working ladies' Bible study on Tuesday night, and the men's Bible study fellowship once a month, the second Tuesday of the month. And, and, uh, and we usually cook something, either me or Tony or somebody else will cook something. And so, guys, we want you all to be part of that. You see... Uh, there's, there's, three, there's three more that I want to start this year. But you realize that this only happens with the resources, that's the, the financial resources and the manpower resources to do this. I'd like to see a college and careers group for, for Amber's age. Uh, that's, the, that's the young people that are under the age of 30. Uh, that, you know, they just don't always fit with the 55 plus. Uh, you know, they're just not a whole lot in common. And yet we have a number of young people in that age group that, that I want to see connected. Uh, the second group I want to see is a young marriage group. Uh, and that's, that's the group of, of, of uh, married people that are 40 and younger, the 20s and 30s. We've got several of those families that, that I want to see someone come and, and take the lead in that. And then I want to I want to see another singles group uh, uh, developed. You know, we, we had a singles group a number of years ago when Brother Randy and uh, Pastor Randy and Miss Rita uh, took over Hope Chapel. It it kind of uh, sent our singles ministry into almost non-existence. But we have a number of singles in our church, and so I want you to pray because you might be the one who'll be the 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 the. Um, uh, the hinge pin, if you would. You might be the one that could be the director for that. And so we want, we want to start that. Sometime this year, I believe we're going in that direction. Amen? Now, we can we create the atmosphere uh, for the glory of God. We uh, communicate the good news. Uh, we cultivate people's hearts for them to become disciples. Uh, we connect them one to another. And all of that up to this point, has been the individual being the receiver on the receiving end, uh, getting involved and doing something. But we would be amiss as a church if we didn't give people an opportunity to contribute into the ministry. Contribute, uh, and, and that means to demonstrate. And so it's not necessarily that we want you to be involved in the four walls of the church. And yes, there are some things that we need. There are some, some ministry of helps places that you can get involved in. But realize that uh, ministry and church is everyday people doing everyday ministry. It's just ordinary people doing ordinary ministry. It doesn't mean that you have to have a, a college degree. Doesn't have, you don't have to have a Bible school diploma in order to be involved in the ministries of helps or in the ministries that God's called you to do. Ephesians chapter 4 says that, they all, that God gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and pastors and teachers. 
And he said, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. See, we are the equippers. You are the workers. We're the ones who equip you to do the work of the ministry. And so we recognize that a lot of people will call, Pastor, would you pray with such and such to be born again? Well, I can, but why don't you do it? You know, you can do that. Well, I, I'm going to send somebody, Pastor, for you. Would you go visit somebody in the hospital and pray with them? I can do that. But you know what? You can do that. And so uh, that, that's all part of being connected as a body. As this place grows, and I'm believing that we will, more, we will close to double by the end of 2015, it is becoming more and more, more and more, um, impossible for me to do everything that I do. And so it's going to be more and more than I'm going to want to delegate some things and just simply oversee. And, and I'm a good delegator, <laughs> but I'm not a micromanager. In other words, I'm not going to delegate something and then do it for you. I'm going to delegate and then I'm just going to inspect that it's done. Amen. Amen. Expect and inspect. Amen. See, that's, that's good. I like that. <laughs> good manager does it that way. And so, uh, get involved. So, so what, do we, what do we demonstrate? The two things that God demonstrated through Jesus, the two things that Jesus demonstrated every day, everywhere he went, was two things. He demonstrated, one, God's love. He demonstrated God's love for people. You know, if, it's said, if nothing is said more about Living Glory Church than when people walk in that front door and they said, I sense the love in that place. And see, I hear that. I hear people saying there was something there. I felt love there. I felt a connection there. Never been there before, but the people were so friendly. Now, now I'm going to say it this way. I don't believe that we need to have 15 people from the front door to the seat shaking hands with people. But if you've got one or two that have the, the right attitude and the right smile. Because if you're just, if you're running through the gauntlet and say, glad you're here, glad you're here, glad you're here, glad you're here, it's all mechanical. Right. And people walk in and they can, they know that it's, it's just mechanical. But when they see some of you as our greeters and you, you just smile, we are so glad you're here. Is, do, do you need help with the kids? Do you need me to show you something? Uh, here's, here's a bulletin. Sanctuary's right there. Bathrooms are in the other building. Just being friendly. People just, just, just gravitate to that. Amen? And I believe, I believe that's going to mean a, a big thing. So we need to show God's love. Number two is, is that uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 says... From whom the whole body joined and knitted together by, by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. That's the New King James. Every part does its share. That means that the head does his part and the little toe on the right foot does its part and, and the hand does its part and, and the mouth does its part. And the ears does its part. And see, because we're all part of the body. And so it's a matter of each one of us finding our place where we fit within the structure of Living Glory Church. See, Jesus declared and demonstrated God's love, but he also proclaimed and de demonstrated the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not uh, uh, a, a, a spooky natural thing, but the Holy Spirit can work in your life through the manifestations of the gifts, through the, through the empowerment and the growth of the fruit of the Spirit. And so it's important that as a church, we, we uh, communicate God's love 
and we demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the, and in the structure of the church. The last thing is, is there, there, there needs to be within the organization, within the church, what I call teamwork. The book of Nehemiah is, is the great example of teamwork. Nehemiah was nothing more than a cupbearer, and he was given the responsibility, he was given the vision to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. 